Thank you all very much. It's great to be here. Uh, Joel didn't mention I'm a TEDS alum. I think I first heard the words dikaiosune theu from the New Testament scholar seated in the back on my left. <laughs> so uh, TEDS has a lot of memories for me, and I'm always, always glad to be back here. Um, my talk, as you've seen, is entitled Goodness That Abides. I have a PowerPoint I don't know that I can keep up with advances in PowerPoint technology, but I, do, I have a few pictures. Uh, <laughs> I always think of the PowerPoint as actually a way to sort of distract your listeners. Uh, that is to say, nobody can pay attention to you for that long. I just assume that. So I give you, if your mind wanders, uh, well, look at the pictures, look at the little words that I put up there, and you'll still kind of be on topic. So when you zoom back into the talk, you'll say, oh, so he's still talking about that. <laughs> uh, so I decided to start with a digression. Um, student evaluations are always fun to read. Everyone enjoys them. I certainly do. <laughs> Students apparently think I digress from time to time in my lectures. I'm not sure they can always tell what a digression is, but they think I do it. And so I thought I'd just, you know, go right ahead and start out with a digression today. <laughs> and so my digression, uh, somewhat off topic, I want to know how well you can see that. Ah, uh, yeah. So I was at a conference a few years ago. I met an art historian named Pia Cuneo. And Pia was giving a paper. She's an art historian, doesn't do theology. She was giving a paper called Luther's Horses. And I thought, this has got to be fun. My wife loves horses. I thought, I'm going. So I went to listen to Pia's paper on uh, Luther's Horses. And at the center of it is this painting. Uh, by uh, Cronach the Younger from the workshop of Lucas Cronach in Wittenberg from uh, the 16th century. And this is a painting that portrays the conversion of St. Paul on the road to Damascus. This is a topic also I've written about, so I found it really interesting. And what's fun in this picture, and I just want to say this, so I, this is not part of my talk, but it's just kind of there. Um, you can see that the heavens are open, uh, and Christ is looking down. And you remember, Christ, you know, he's going to bump into Paul there, and, you know, it's, it's tough. And Paul is going down, and the scene is full of confusion, and you can see the soldiers are confused and so on. But if you look to the center of the picture at the horse, what's he doing? The horse is genuflecting. The horse is genuflecting. Because the horse knows, and the men don't that the Lord God of heaven and earth has just arrived on the scene. And this reminds me of a theme in Luther's theology that's really quite unusual. Uh, that is, when the heavens groan out, they groan against us. And this is quite explicit, frequent in Luther's writings. They complain about their fallen masters and how poorly they handle their world. So just for the Romans 8 thing, I thought I'd toss that in. Now off with the paper. <clears throat> in what follows, I'll draw attention to one prominent example each of medieval Catholic and early modern Protestant attempts to, seek through, to think through a series of questions regarding, regarding Adam, the fall, and the goodness of God. I turn first to Thomas Aquinas' systematic work on these questions and then to some distinctive contributions made by Martin Luther. Thomas, of course, has been a central figure in Christian theology for a long while, and he is especially prominent in Roman Catholic theology. My paper is not an attempt to take the measure of Thomas's influence on Luther. Instead, I take up Thomas as a prominent example of the approach to questions regarding the creation and fall of humankind in medieval scholastic theology. My brief foray into the work of Aquinas will lead us into a consideration of parallel themes in Luther's lectures on Genesis, where I'll be especially concerned to make sense of Luther's assertion that in fallen humankind, the image of God has been lost, with the imago diaboli, the image of the devil, taking its place. I'm fully aware of some of the ironies one might sense in seating Luther and Aquinas together at the dinner table. Thomas has a popular reputation as a staunch defender of Catholic orthodoxy, while Luther has a reputation as, well, Something other than that. <laughs> Those reputations notwithstanding, it is essential for us to recognize from the outset that both these men intended to believe, teach, and confess the faith once delivered. 
Each of these two men developed deep insight into the various challenges faced by theology in their day. In response, each also became a powerfully creative and daring Christian thinker. The extent of Thomas's theological daring is accurately suggested by the apparent condemnation of some of his teachings by the Bishop of Paris just a few years after his death. The common doctor, it seems, sometimes found himself on the bleeding edge of theological debate in the 13th century. For his part, Martin Luther was, all right, notoriously daring, even defiant, willing to blaze a new trail when he thought it necessary. I seat Thomas and Luther together then because they were courageous men who meant to find faithful answers to the besetting problems of their day. Now to Thomas Aquinas. We read Thomas better if we imagine ourselves stepping into the theology department at the University of Paris in the mid-13th century, where all the hubbub going on has to do with attempts to integrate some newly discovered sources of Arabic and Aristotelian philosophy with the traditional sources of Christian revelation. This hubbub continued for generations after Thomas's death, so we should hesitate to say that the man himself achieved a final synthesis between theology and those newly discovered philosophical sources. We should press the pause button before we rush to fault his later medieval successors, moreover, for having eroded any such presumed achievement. To the contrary, later medieval thinkers continued to do what Thomas himself had done, that is, to seek a proper balance between faith and philosophy. Recognizing the broad continuity between Aquinas and his later medieval successors, we should apply with caution even such well-worn labels as high or late to the long Middle Ages. Instead, we should imagine all the medievals faced with problems of faith, faith and reason. Their struggles are not dissimilar to the ones we face today as we attempt to integrate the traditions of faith with the findings of modern science. Just as Aristotle was unavoidable for Aquinas and his heirs, so evolution and the Big Bang are unavoidable for us. As he worked to develop theology in response to the challenges of his day, Thomas Aquinas always had one eye on the doctrine of creation. Indeed, as Joseph Pieper has observed, Creation is the often unrecognized Notenschlüssel to Thomas's theology as a whole. The key, that is, that unlocks the melody of his thought for our understanding. Thomas's extraordinarily rich reflections on creation are found broadly across the corpus of his writings, including, first of all, his commentary on Peter Lombard's famous sentences, for more than 300 years, Lombard was the standard textbook for advanced theological education in the West. In fact, it was the very book on which the young Augustinian friar Martin Luther would later cut his own theological teeth. Additional sources for Thomas's doctrine of creation include his two summas, one against the Contra Gentiles and another called the Summa Theologiae. In what follows here, I draw ad hoc on these writings, aware of the historical discontinuities in his thought that would warn us away from any too easy systematic reconstruction. Even Thomas changed his mind once or twice. The order followed here then is mine, not Thomas's. I began by exploring three crucial elements in Thomas's doctrine of God's good creation and then take up three points in his theological anthropology. Number one, the word of God. We begin with a famous question, why does God create? Given the all-sufficiency of the Holy Trinity within itself, it seems that no final answer to this question can be given. Nevertheless, Thomas has some ideas. To help us ponder this mystery productively, Thomas suggests a Christocentric point of departure. What if we begin by thinking about the Word of God, that is, the eternal Son of the eternal Father? This only begotten Son, he notes, is understood as the interior Word of the Father in such a way that he remains within the Father even as he proceeds from him. Thinking about the word of God himself, therefore, our attention is drawn to a relation within the Godhead that is both internal and eternal. As an irreducible relational reality within the one God, the word of God is a person, the eternal son of the eternal father, the personally subsistent emanation of the divine mind. Pondering the mystery of the relation between word and speaker, Thomas senses a hint of the possibility of a further relation, 
one that extends, so to speak, outside the Godhead. Here, a new question arises. Does the name word import relation to creatures? Thomas answers, because God by one act understands himself and all things, this one word is expressive not only of the Father, but of all creatures. Enclosed within the relational identity of the word, we discover a hint of God's relations ad extra with everything that is outside of God. Thomas next puts to work a distinction between expression and operation. Ad intra, so Thomas, the word is the expression of the mind of the Father. Ad extra, however, the word both expresses and works. The word expresses creatures as they are found in the eternal divine act of knowing and works them up into being. Here a question arises, given that the Son or Word of God is understood as an eternal person within the Godhead, does Thomas mean to, set, uh, to uh, hint that creation itself is also eternal? Is the Word both the eternal expression of what is in God and the eternal maker of an eternal world? The question of eternal creation was alive and well in the Paris of Thomas's day. Robert Pasnow explains, quote, Bonaventure had argued that creation ex nihilo necessarily implies a temporal beginning. According to Aquinas, on the other hand, creation from nothing means that things are caused by God in their complete being. This does not necessarily mean, however, that the creation had a temporal beginning. A cause does not necessarily precede its effect in duration, but can be simultaneous with the effect, end quote. This means that in Thomas's world, one cannot rule out philosophically the possibility of an eternal creation. Absent philosophical demonstration, one can know that the world began in time only by divine revelation. To this, we must add the following. God is called creator not only in reference to his being the cause of the creation's existence, but also with regard to his continuing conservation of it. Indeed, for Thomas, Creation and conservation are logically distinct, but they name a single continuous act. God was and is, therefore, the creator. A brief digression. Consider for, and here I want to go sort of at some contemporary issues. There I go digressing again. Consider for a moment some recent, uh, some of the present day implications drawn uh, from Thomas's view, which is often applied to questions regarding faith and science. Writing recently from Oxford, for example, William Carroll, following Aquinas, takes on scientific claims that would exclude an original act of creation. Carroll argues against those claims by explaining that, quote, creation is not really an event at all. God's act of creation is not within the explanatory domain of cosmology. Indeed, instead, it is a subject for metaphysics and theology. Therefore, by Carroll's lights, it is a mistake to use arguments in the natural sciences to deny creation. It is also a mistake to appeal to cosmology as a confirmation of creation. I, I mean to contest these views. <laughs> so if I'm not being clear about that, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm a historian. We don't always make it clear when we're trying to argue with someone else. We just tell stories. <laughs> By my lights. There's the key. By my lights, Carol seems here to dichotomize science and theology. Science, it seems is concerned with changing things, theology with the unchanging God, and never the twain shall meet. Moreover, Carroll's arguments seem to mute Thomas's well-known doctrine of analogy, which goes like this. There we are. Human language cannot univocally name or express the God who is wholly other. Nevertheless, by means of an odd sort of analogy, the analogy of proportion, we can speak of God really and truly. When, for example, we say that God is love, we have a real and true idea what this means, even if God as God infinitely surpasses it. As Brian Davies observes, for Aquinas, our language about God is meaningful only if, quote, words applied to creatures cannot mean something entirely different when applied to God, end quote. Analogous human speech of this type, moreover, seems to fit well alongside Thomas's enthusiastic appropriation of the Augustinian idea that the whole creation bears the imprint of its triune creator, what he calls vestigia trinitatis, vestiges of the trinity. If such an imprint is really there, shouldn't we expect to see it when we look, even insofar as it witnesses to the event of creation? 
Does God's act of creation leave no trace? The notion of the divine imprint, moreover, brings us back to the goodness of the creation. Both the traces of the Trinity found in the creation and the human capacity to know these traces and love God through them are understood as gifts of grace. The love of God given to us in the only begotten Son is the self-same word through which God lovingly brought forth the good creation. Finally, as we shall see below, Thomas's Adam could learn a lot about God just by looking at the creation. With these remarks, we return to our consideration of Thomas, uh, my point two. In Thomas's theology, creation is a divine act in which the creature gains everything, the creator nothing. God by creation produces all things without movement. Put in philosophical terms, this means that the creature by virtue of its creation gains a real relation to God, while for his part, God gains nothing. Indeed, for Thomas, God has no real relations to creatures. This is a 13th century way of saying that God adds nothing to himself through the act of producing the creation. A brief explanation. To denote God's impassable way of relating to the creation, theologians in Thomas's day invented a new term, relatio rationis, a relation of reason. Real relations, they figured, always require a pair of things that are related to one another, that impact one another, and so that exist on the same, as it were, ontological playing field. Are there real relations within God? Of course, Thomas answers. The one God is three persons, related to one another dynamically in the mystery of divine love. The Father, the Son, the Spirit are in real relation to one another. Are there similar real relations between God and creation? No. If that is so, then how can one speak of God in relation to creatures? One must speak, so the answer goes, as if God and the creature are really related to one another on a single ontological playing field. Considering the divine side of the creator-creature relation, then, one conceives of God as related to the creature and then projects this property onto him. In so doing, the relation of God to the creature becomes an interationis, a creature of reason, which exists only as an idea in the mind of the knower. The relation of reason is thus a logical concept necessary so that finite intellectual creatures can make some sense of their creator. Within himself, however, God remains ineffable in his impassibility, unchanged by the creature's relation to himself. This means that the creator-creature relation is radically dissimilar from the sorts of relations we encounter day to day and radically, as well, uh, radically dissimilar as well from the real relations that pertain within the divine persons in the Trinity. But why does God gain nothing when he brings the creation into being? The answer lies in the ontology of the divine, and for Thomas it can be expressed compactly in the phrase pure act. Pure act is a traditional Catholic paraphrase of the divine name, I am who I am. This paraphrase depends for its intelligibility on the medieval distinction between act and potency. Act and potency can perhaps more easily be understood as the difference between perfection and imperfection. The perfect is that which has already arrived at its goal, while the imperfect is that which is on its way. It seems odd to put it this way, but the perfect lacks potency. That is, it has no unrealized potential. Cosmic history, therefore, includes no divine agon, no cosmic striving, because, well, God is not in process. All that God can be is already fully actualized, present, real, and effective. God for Thomas, therefore, is all those things, fully actualized, transcendentally present, emphatically real, and all powerfully effective. God, in short, is the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Point number three, prime matter, yes, I have a picture. <laughs> you always wondered what it looked like? There it is. <laughs> uh, I think I just looked up blob on Google Images. You know. <laughs> prime matter, form matter, and creation ex nihilo. Thomas believes that in the act of creation, God brought forth all things from nothing. In relation to created things, therefore, God is the universal cause. Viewed philosophically, the creatures God has made consist of two things, matter and form. Prime or unformed matter denotes pure unrealized potential, the intrinsic it-could-be-ness of things. 
Form, on the other hand, means the plan or rationale of a thing, that which brings it out of mere potential and into the actuality of this or that particular thing. That is to say, particular creatures are what they are because a form has been given to matter that was hitherto unformed. The concept of prime matter implies an important question. Does prime matter exist prior to its instantiation in actual things? If so, then should we picture Thomas's God hastily cobbling together forms so as to bring order to the primordial chaos of prime matter? Some readers of Thomas interpret him this way. We understand the matter better, however, if we remind ourselves that for Thomas, prime or unformed matter has no existence apart from its reality as the underlying substrate, so to speak, of form substances. Prime matter, therefore, is not a name given to a primeval chaos that resists the creator's efforts. Instead, it is simply the underlying reality that explains what happens when created sub substances come into being or undergo substantial change. Change, after all, is the first defining characteristic of created things, from nothing into something. To be made is to be changed. Substantial change continues after the creation as well. The substance of the mouse killed, by, killed and eaten by the cat, for example, undergoes substantial change in the process of metabolism to the effect that it is no longer mouse, but cat. The matter remains the same, but its substantial form has changed to continue to exist is to continue to change. An important aside, Thomas's view that prime matter has no real existence until and unless its pure potency is actualized in particular created substance was not shared by all. Notably, Dunn Scotus and William Ockham criticized the notion that unformed matter is nothing prior to its formation to, into particular substances. We will return to this point uh, when we discuss Luther below. I turn now to a brief consideration of three crucial moments in Thomas's theological anthropology. And with that, you get a new picture. Uh, unfortunately, Thomas is apparently using Luther's painter uh, in doing his theological anthropology. He was the Adam I had on hand, so I just had to throw him on there. All right. <laughs> Number one, before sin, Adam was immortal and he knew God. In the, in the natura pura of the original creation, Thomas's Adam was, as it turns out, in a very good place, even beyond the fact that he lived in a garden of delights with his amazing wife. First, he'd been, he had experienced the change of coming into being, what a delight it must have been and should continue to be, to find that we have life. Adam, moreover, had good reason to be particularly pleased because man, according to Thomas, was immortal before sin. Citing Romans 5.12, Thomas reminds his readers that by death sin came into the world. Before sin, Adam was intended to live forever. Thomas also considers the human knowledge of God. Creaturely knowledge of God for Thomas is always imperfect because it's never complete. No creature can comprehend God. Nevertheless, Adam, the dirtling of Genesis, as I've learned to call him here, knew God. Well then, did Adam know God in the same manner as we do now? Thomas's answer to this question depends in part on his understanding of the image of God, which I'll address further in a few moments. For now, it's sufficient to recall that the image for Thomas is in some sense centered in the intellect. It has to do with rationality. Rational creatures, both angelic and human, participate in God more deeply than non-rational ones. Thus, Thomas will say that the angel's knowledge of God is more perfect than our own because as intellectual beings, they have a knowledge of God unmediated by the unintellectual material of which we are made. Right? Recall here as well that Thomas gives a certain primacy to the five human senses, a position compactly summarized in his, uh, in his assertion that, quote, nothing is in the intellect that was not first in the senses. This is interesting. Our rational knowledge of God, thought, cognition, comes to us through sight and sound. Knowledge of the divine rides to our minds along our nerves and in our bloodstream. Now we're ready to understand Thomas's answer to the question, how well Adam knew God. His answer? Better than we do now, but not as well as we will in heaven. Except perhaps for the ecstatic sleep imposed on Adam when God drew the woman out of his side. In that case, Thomas allows, <clears throat> God may have granted the first created man a foretaste of the vision of the divine essence. But that vision itself is the beatitude enjoyed by the saints in glory, and the ability to see it was not included in Adam's original powers. 
Had Adam already possessed that vision, Thomas figures, then he could not have turned away from God and fallen into sin. Therefore, Adam enjoyed the vision of God, not in the divine essence, but as seen through his creatures. Put differently, the knowledge of God was present and immediate to him in the creation. Thomas allows one other possible route through which Adam, before the fall, may have known God. This one based on a surmise Adam had made, uh, Augustine had made in his literal commentary on Genesis. Thomas quotes Augustine thus, Perhaps God used to speak the truth to the first man as he speaks to the angels. By shedding on his mind a ray of the unchangeable truth, yet without bestowing on him the experience of which the angels are capable in their participation in the divine essence. Adam's knowledge of God thus far surpassed our own, and it came to him by means of the creation itself, and sometimes by direct divine illumination without the mediation of the senses. Lastly, Thomas reasons, Adam, in the integrity of the natura pura, could not be deceived. Indeed, in the state of original innocence, it was impossible for the human intellect to consent to falsehood. Adam's first sin, therefore, must have begun not in the mind, but in the will a point that should be taken into account when one is tempted to position Thomas within a rationalist tradition over against a voluntarist one. Number two, original sin is the reception of Adam's one sin by all his progeny. For Thomas, it's proper to say that all human beings have only a single first parent and not a plural first parents. Why? Because that's how the human race is propagated in Thomas's understanding. My Marquette colleague summarizes it this way. <laughs> Quote, Adam's seed is a kind of biological hammer and tool kit that works over Eve's material contribution to fashion it into an ensouled living thing into which, yes, God eventually infuses a rational soul. You have a kind of series here where you, the, the thing in the womb goes through vegetative soul, animal soul, and at last the infusion of uh, an intellectual, intellectual soul. The man's seed, therefore, was a kind of separated instrument of the personal nature of the man, which was somehow able to produce, or in the 13th century language, educe life from maternal matter, end quote. In this way, Adam's nature was passed down to all his progeny, and so it continues, Thomas believes, down to the present day. Original sin, therefore, denotes the passing on of the one sin of Adam. It denotes, that is to say, Adam's first act of sin only, his disobedience of the divine command, and not any subsequent sins he may have committed. Original sin affects all those who are descended from Adam through seminal power. To this claim, one might give the well-known Lutheran catechetical response, what does this mean? <laughs> hmm. It means, in short, that everybody loses. By his sin, Adam lost the gifts of original justice and sanctifying grace, Prior to Adam's, to that sin, he had these gifts in the essence of the soul. The essence of the soul, by the way, means the form of the body. This essence is the integrating principle of the human being. Sanctifying grace ordered Adam's will and intellect in submission to God, while original justice ordered his appetites in submission to reason. These two gifts then, sanctifying grace, original justice, <clears throat> are what all Adam's progeny lost as a consequence of his original sin. Excuse me. <clears throat> original sin, therefore, is formally present, formally present, formally present in the soul of every son or daughter of Adam only as an absence. Original sin is privative. The absence of sanctifying grace and original justice has deleterious effects on all the powers of the soul, will, intellect, sensation, as well as the appetitive powers, desire, etc., Materially then, materially, the privation that constitutes original sin is manifested in the disordered disposition, dispositions that result from the corruption of human nature. Thus, Thomas can say, quote, original sin is more than mere privation. It is a corrupt habit, end quote. The fallen human's complex of corrupt habits also has a name, uh, disordered concupiscence. It is important in that connection to note that for Thomas, concupiscence in its proper denotation is simply the name for the soul's powers of attraction to the good. In and of itself, therefore, the concupiscent powers of the soul are gifts of God, natural goods, bodily desires, whether for food or for sex, for example, are consistent with Adam's original justice. Thus, in the state of pure nature, Adam was truly a rational animal, animal insofar as he was an animated and embodied creature, 
rational insofar as he had been made, enabled by divine gifts both to keep himself in order and to know and love his maker. After the fall, however, the soul's powers of attraction have become disordered. Disordered concupiscence names the material effect of the fall on human nature. With that, we come to the question of the image of God. <clears throat> so are fallen human beings still made in the image of God? For Thomas, yes and no. First, the yes. Thomas often speaks of the image of God as located in the mind, the intellect. While there are traces of the Trinity in the human body as in all other bodies, the concrete location of the in image of God, properly so called, is in the intellectual soul. The human intellect Im images God first insofar as its own act of self-knowledge echoes the internal dynamism of the Holy Trinity. Thomas writes, Now the divine persons are distinct from each other by reason of the procession of the word from the speaker and the procession of love from uh, connecting both. Speaker, word, love. There's the Trinity, right? But in our soul, word cannot exist without actual thought. As Augustine says, we not only uh, have a soul, but we also think about what we're thinking. Therefore, first and chiefly, the image of the Trinity is to be found in acts of the soul, that is, inasmuch as from the knowledge we possess by actual thought, we form an internal word and thence break forth into love. Here the speaker corresponds to human knowledge, the divine word, to human thinking about what we know, and the divine love to the way human love becomes effective through the exercise of the will. You can see that ethics are already embedded, as it were, in this image, the sort of moral life, doing good, uh, acts of love. Knowledge, thought, and love, these three logically parallel moments constitute the image of the Trinity in the human being. The human relation to God thus has a call and response character. Our intellectual trinity of mind, word, and love answers to and is elevated by grace to participate in the love that is the eternal life of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Fallen human beings remain the image of God in another sense as well. In Adam's fall, the natural human inclination to the good was diminished, but not uh, destroyed. People still have this inclination, though it exists only in the jumble of internal contradictions we sinners experience as a consequence of our disordered concupiscence. We, in other words, retain an innate sense of true moral first principles. For example, we know innately that evil is to be avoided, that nothing illicit is to be done. In that sense, too, the image remains in us, even if in the confusions of life in a fallen world it has been diminished. Where, then, do we find Thomas saying no to the image of God? In what sense has it been lost? solely in the loss of sanctifying grace and original justice. Now I turn to Martin Luther. <clears throat> we'll get out of Paris and head to the German frontier. Leaving 13th century Paris, we now travel to the frontier German city of Wittenberg, Residenzstadt of the Prince Elector of Saxony, where Martin Luther himself is at the center of a hubbub quite different from the one that occupied Thomas and company. The year is 1535. We arrive in Luther's crowded classroom at 6 a.m., where he's just beginning to lecture on First Moses, the book of Genesis. Working his way through this text over the next 10 years and getting it all down on paper with the assistance of a devoted group of student note-takers, Luther will leave to posterity a monumental theological artifact in the form of some 3,000 pages or so of mostly extemporaneous Latin and sometimes German commentary, quote, on the Bible's first book. He will die only a few months after completing the work. The Genesis lectures, as his note-takers later put it, were Martin Luther's swan song. For technical reasons that need not distract us here, these monumental lectures have received comparatively little attention in the vast literature on Martin Luther. And in his own preface to the first published volume of the work, Luther himself admitted that he'd been too disorganized, too prolix, and that the text deserved much more careful attention than he had been able to give. However true that may be, the lectures on Genesis remain arguably the single richest source for the theology of the elder Luther. As such, the work resists even the most determined efforts at compact summary, as I am trying to do here. For that reason, as I announced above, I focus on a single issue in Luther's interpretation, the image of God in man. Before we turn to that problem, however, let's sketch out Luther's broad agreement with much of what we've found in the teaching of Aquinas covered above. Number one, Luther's reception of scholastic tradition. 
This is really important. For a very long time, everybody who knew Luther said that he was not a scholastic theologian. He was against scholastic theology. The truth is you can't understand Luther unless you know that he is a scholastic theologian. He has exactly the same uh, uh, advanced degrees that Thomas Aquinas earned, read most of the same books, and adopted similar methods. There are new things going on with Luther, but that's not uh, sort of uh, the locus. So the list of matters on which these two men were agreed is very long. Naturally, Luther agrees with the creedal confirmation, affirmation that there's but one God. Luther also accepts and teaches his students the tradition according to which the word of God is distinguished within the Godhead just as a word and he who utters a word are distinct. This sounds a little abstruse when you talk about the word and the utterance and the speaker and the mind of God, and so it sounds abstruse. It sounds like something, you know, those scholastic guys would have done. Luther loves this stuff. He loves this stuff. He knows it forwards and backwards. He can run it in all the different forms that one might sort of do it. In the, mm, I'm going to skip this part about real relations because I don't want to uh, 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 use up too much time. Like Thomas, Luther is willing to admit that he has learned a lot from Aristotle as, men, as well as many other non-Christian thinkers. He also generally agrees with Thomas that the Christian reading of Scripture should be informed but cannot be determined by the findings of philosophy. At the same time, Luther feels much freer to disagree with Aristotle. He dismisses out of hand, for example, the question of the eternality of the world. Whoops, up up there. He dismisses that question out of hand. He knows that Aristotle leans toward that opinion and that there are good philosophical reasons to take it seriously. Still, he feels no need to explain his rejection of Aristotle's view. Why? Because Moses says so. Quote, we know from Moses that the world was not in existence before 6,000 years ago, end quote. Divine authority trumps probable philosophical argument. Luther also goes his own way concerning the question of prime and form matter. He quarrels not with the distinction itself, but with the, with the assertion that prime matter is almost nothing prior to its instantiation in particular formed things. To the contrary, Luther reads prime matter as really something. In fact, a something that has a name, tohu wabohu, the formless void. God's first act of creation on Luther's account brought into being the concrete formlessness of prime matter. He portrays it as a sort of dark mist, an undifferentiated lump, cloudy and indefinite, real but as yet nothing in particular. So it is that creation days two through six bring new things into being and in that sense continue the divine act of creation ex nihilo, while at the same time building on the formless mass of Genesis 1. Each day God continues to create, and by means of these new acts of creation, God forms, orders, and adorns prime matter. Nor is Luther content to appeal to secondary causes alone to explain what happens in the world. This is a tendency among Thomistic thinkers and also with Thomas. You've got a God as primary cause and then all kinds of secondary sort of this worldly causes. And if you want to understand things, you just want to understand the secondary causes. Luther doesn't like this very much. First, he doesn't think you should look at a secondary cause that way. <laughs> Second of all, he thinks God is just active. Okay? God is actively involved both in the regular course of affairs in the creation and in extraordinary events of all kinds. Luther pauses to consider select examples of sovereign exercises of God's freedom in which natural causation is reversed or revised, including signs in the heavens above, for example. Even more so, however, he draws attention to everyday miracles. For example, that the sun runs through the sky along a regular path, that the heavier land reposes atop the lighter water, that mice spontaneously generate from those dust bunnies left behind by that lazy housemaid. Yes, he does that. Better to focus on the wonders that surround us each day, Luther seems to suggest, than to seek new portents in the skies. Indeed, Luther repeatedly draws attention to the many opportunities we have to be amazed by the beauty of our world and the goodness of its maker. Luther's faith sees design everywhere. Nature stands ever at the ready to provide stirring witness to the ongoing work of the creator. Here, Luther also praises astronomy as a discipline. Uh, and I'll skip the rest of that. Luther also accepts the traditional exegetical finding that the breath of God in Genesis 2 denotes not the infusion of the divine spirit, but the gift of the intellectual soul. Indeed, Luther offers a ringing endorsement of it. The following quote neatly mitigates any too easy dismissal of Luther as a fideist and reminds us that he respected the work of his colleagues. 
And I have a long uh, quote here where he praises uh, the sciences uh, of all kinds. And he says about the human being, he does this sort of man the microcosm thing that you often see uh, in the literature around this time. That is to say, the human being encapsulates within himself both the heavenly that is above and the earthly that is below, combines all these things. But the human being is meant for the celestial heights. That's what the intellectual nature of the soul given in Genesis 2 means for Martin Luther. Uh, another bit I want to do before I give, i got a few minutes, all right. <laughs> I want to talk about the words of God uh, in Genesis 1 when God speaks things into being. Luther does really quite interesting stuff, stuff there. Uh, this for Luther is the sort of paradigm of how divine speech works, what it does. Luther says, quote, God calls into existence things which do not exist. He does not speak grammatical words. He speaks true and existent realities. According to that, accordingly, that which among us has the sound of a word is reality with God. Thus, sun, moon, heaven, earth, Peter, Paul, I, you, etc., we are all words of God. End quote. That the creation of these little words is to be understood Christocentrically, Luther also makes clear. Created words are brought into being by the uncreated word. Luther's Christocentric reading of the act of creation should be seen as borrowed from the antecedent tradition, but his language about it, I think, is really quite new and uh, quite distinctive. <clears throat> There's an interesting section here that I just want to mention briefly. Luther speaks of God as the wisest mind and speaks of his supreme order, and this uh, explicit sort of language of God as mind connects with the sort of intellectual nature of the human creature. What I mean to do here is to problematize the neat categorizing of Thomas as a rationalist, Luther as a voluntarist. There's a lot of rationalism in Martin Luther, and there's a good bit of very important voluntarism in uh, Thomas Aquinas' end of discussion. Imago Dei. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just about at the end. The order written into the realities brought into being by the wisest mind were, written, were meant to be understood by the human mind. When Luther turns to consider the created minds of Adam and Eve, he emphasizes their capacity to know their world thoroughly and their wise creator through it. Insight, he figures, was necessary for Adam and Eve to fulfill their divinely given mandate to have dominion. And in this connection... He can even speak of the noetic capacities of our first parents as divine. Adam and Eve had insight into all the dispositions of all the animals, into their characters and all their powers, Luther writes. Moreover, Luther makes clear that the gift of insight was bestowed equally upon the woman who was to rule with her husband over all the earth. Let's listen in on the lecture. If we are looking for an outstanding philosopher, let us not overlook our first parents while they were still free from sin. They had a most perfect knowledge of God and the most dependable knowledge of the stars and of the whole of astronomy. Eve had these mental gifts in the same degree as Adam, end quote. What does it mean, Luther asks, when Scripture says that these first human beings were graced with an intellectual soul? Luther's answer begins with an extensive rehearsal of the Augustinian tradition of the Trinity of Man. He doesn't argue with this. His problem with it, however, that is that in mentioning the will, uh, a discussion is opened concerning free will. And so Luther's worry is that the scholastic recognition of a kind of trinity in the human being, which includes the will, will mean that, as his own experience suggests, we all have a free will, and by means of exercising the free will as an efficient cause, we, in effect, make or create our own salvation. This, for Luther, is a pretty big no-no. He's unhappy about this. This will have been talked about a lot in the years after Martin Luther, but that was the primary concern. Departing from the talk about these powers of the soul here, Luther uh, goes a different direction. The image of God in humankind, Luther wants to say, consists in much more. Think of the tranquility with which the first humans carried the clearest intellect, the best memory, the rightest will. Note the congruence between these internal qualities and the superb qualities of their bodies. Behold, Adam and Eve, in shameless embrace, unembarrassed before their God. 
And now consider we fallen humans. All the powers, all the tranquility, all the amazing attributes are corrupted. Sin works on the image he avers like a leprosy, gradually eroding it away. Blessed with the image, Adam was upright before God. He and Eve lived completely without fear. Why? No death. They had the image of the living God and possessed, possessed it with a reflexive confidence in their immortality. Considering this image as a whole, Luther figures we have to admit that the image of God in humankind is today completely unknown. Instead, we palpably experience not only the privation of this image, but also all the evils that follow in its wake, loss of the dominion, execrable lust, sinful passions, inordinate emotions, fear of death and every other dangers, bodies degraded in every way, nature opaque to our, gra uh, to our gaze, its inner workings unknown. Luther's conclusion these and similar evils are the image of the devil who stamped them upon us. Any account that fails to recognize this, Luther figures, underestimates the deleterious impact of original sin on the whole human being. <clears throat> the way I would summarize this, original sin for Luther affects the progressive decreation of the human person. Indeed, the language in which the idea is couched, the loss of original gifts, a leprosy on the power of the soul, corruption of the integrity of nature. All of this language shows that it is fundamentally privative and therefore not, so to speak, additive. For both Luther and Thomas, then, original sin is more than just privation, but it is not ontologized. Materially, original sin is reflected in the degradation which the theological tradition labels disordered concupiscence. In just that sense, and precisely to that extent, for Luther, the image of God has been lost and sinners have become imitators of the devil. I skipped a section on the imitatio diaboli, right? To put it just a bit differently, our goodness abides, but sin threatens to undo it completely. With that, I think I'm going to call it halt. Thank you very much for your attention.